Hello and welcome to another episode of This Is My Architecture. Today we're talking about going beyond just prediction with evolutionary AI. And I'm joined by Dan from Cognizant. Dan, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Todd. Can you tell us a little bit about the learning evolutionary AI framework from Cognizant? Sure. So what we are uh, providing is uh, a service which allows people to discover uh, through evolutionary computation uh, uh, neural network architectures. And really it all starts out with an experiment host that's spun up in the customer's environment and yep. a lot of code that's provided to them. Let's jump right into it. Okay. So uh, the experiment host initiates everything uh, like, like you were saying and it's, it, it's on the customer network which is everything that's, that's down here. Um, and we provide some framework code to, to, to the experiment host so that people don't have to rewrite certain aspects sure. of, of everything. But we really want people to concentrate on their data scientist and what their problem is. But in order to, and in order to do that, we, uh, we need folks to write their own domain code, which is basically tells the system as a whole when, they, when the system gets a candidate network uh, that's proposed by, by the system, how is that going to be evaluated? What, uh, what things are going to be measured about it. A lot of times it's loss, but in our system it can be anything you want. Maybe you have a blue score, or maybe you're looking for overall network size, or okay. stuff like that. And then we also have the overall configuration data, uh, which is just, it's, it's not the actual data set, but it's, it's the data that, that tells the system, how do I set this whole thing up? When I go to evaluate these networks, um, how many workers, uh, how many worker instances do I, uh, do I need to, to spin up? What kind of instances are they? Are they GPU instances? Are they CPU instances? And then the other thing that goes in the configuration data that's, that's really important is uh, the, the, the configuration of, of the evolutionary bounds to what layers are being used and even down to what are the boundaries for my hyperparameters that I'm also going to evolve at the same time as these networks. Okay, great. So that code's provided to the customer's experiment host. Can they change that configuration data as well? Yes. Uh, it's, it's, it, it, the configuration data is intended to be, um, it's intended to be checked into to repository so you can keep track of things if you want to do that. It's also, in, we provide templates for for, for that configuration data for different types of problems. If an image problem, then this is how you might set something up, that, that type of thing. Got it, got it. So I'm all set up as a customer, and I need to connect into the Cognizant platform itself, and I see an ENN service, which ENN stands for? Evolved Neural Networks. Okay, great. <laughs> okay, so again, what we're evolving is the architecture of these neural networks. And the, the, experiment, with, the experiment host is really the, um, it's, it, it kicks off the whole process, and so it, does an initial communication to the ENN service, which says, hey, I don't, I don't know anything to, to, to try to evaluate here. And so the ENN service kind of wakes up and says, okay, I'm going to generate some networks from scratch, some small networks. We're going to see how they do relative to each other. Okay. And this is all happening inside our, our microservices, basically. So real quick, behind the scenes from an infrastructure perspective, are these Kubernetes clusters? Are you running COPS Ex on AWS to manage that? Exactly. So we use COPS on AWS to spin up our, our, our microservices. We actually have uh, three microservices. There's, uh, they're all, um, all auto-scaled uh, so that they can handle the different uh, bits, bits of load. All the images for those microservices they're not customer provided. They're 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 uh, they're they're handled by us, so that when we improve our algorithms, that happens behind the scenes. People don't have to have to worry about that. So okay. the ECR will will feed the images to the, of the microservices to to the ENN service, and then while the ENN service goes through multiple generations, which I think we'll get to in a little bit, it ends up storing an internal representation of how it uh, of the data that it needs. Um, uh, to, to basically breed one candidate network with another network, and that stores that in S3 in its own internal representation. Very cool. So whenever Cognizant will push updates to their images, they're all being stored on ECR, yep. headed back down to the ENN service here, and prior to the internal representations being stored on S3, let's talk from a customer perspective how all of this is happening. Okay, so the ENN service um, is, is going to be evolving um, is going to be evolving network architectures. And so what comes back over the wire, as far as the customer is concerned, is, is, is simply a list of, of Kiros JSON, basically. Okay. Which basically says, here, if, if, if you were to create these networks, this is the graph of, of what they would look like. However, what's happening in the service, there's a multiple different 
levels of evolution that are happening at the same time. On, on one angle, there, or on one level of evolution, there is like a low level connectivity, which is like how, you know, I'm gonna con am I gonna connect a dense layer to another dense layer, or am I gonna maybe have a, some convolution in there, or, or whatever. Okay. And what layers you use, that's specified by the configuration data there. But on another la layer, um, there's high level connectivity, which is also being evolved. So you can, if you can think of the low level connectivity as being the, the layers of maybe in an inception module or something like that. The higher level connectivity is how do I connect those other modules together? Like I might have one module to, uh, to do maybe some preliminary image recognition or something like that. And then there's some other modules that start to do some, some specialized stuff. Uh, and then they might all kind of filter down into, 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 into some other module. But you know, the number of nodes in here is going to change how these, how these edges are connected. That's going to change over time, both at the high level and at the low level. Okay. And at the same time, but wait, there's more. We're also evolving all the hyperparameters with, uh, within uh, the individual network layers all at the same time. OK, so there's a form of hyperparameter optimization that's yep. happening behind the scenes. Yep. Let's talk a little bit about the jobs. And it looks like we're queuing the jobs before yes. passing it down to the studio ML workers themselves. Yes. Talk to us about what those instances look like and okay. how the queuing happens. So we talked, to, we talked before about how the, the setup of, of the, the worker instances, which are going to evaluate each of these networks. Uh, or candidate network architectures, I should say. Uh, that is specified in the configuration data. But the experiment host is, is still, um, it's still, it's still kind of running the show, uh, so to speak. Uh, and so when the, when the experiment host gets a, a new generation of, of candidates to be tried, it sends it down through SQS. Uh, and um, there's, a, there's a whole nother cluster which is set up on the, on the customer's side and okay. the, the customer's AWS account while this happens in our, our AWS account the cluster pulls pulls the work off of off of that queue and each individual um, each individual worker from studio ML uh, will um, it, it's going to take a single candidate and it's going to uh, evaluate that candidate in the same way uh, as, as any of its peers in a particular generation so that's really where the generation permutations happen. And is there really going to be some type of percentage of perseverance of the generations? Yes. So what, what ends up happening is after all, the, after all the evaluations happen against the customer's data, right? So the, actually the, the, the data is being dragged into the, uh, dragged into the workers on the customer's own okay. terms. The, the, the results of that are basically measure, usually, usually measured in loss or maybe some other score. And those, on a on a case-by-case on a -case basis, they all end up coming back up to the experiment host uh, okay. whenever they decide to finish, if they decide to finish. Sometimes they go off and have their own party, but the system is robust against that in case nodes go down and stuff like that. Sure. The experiment host gathers up all of those results and basically says, OK, I was looking for 100 evaluations uh, of, of 100 different candidate networks, but what I got maybe Maybe I got all 100 back. That's actually a good day. <laughs> right. um, but I got all 100 back, or maybe I only got 90 back, or something like that within a certain timeout limit. But th then the experiment host says, OK, I'm going to cut my losses. Maybe I didn't hear from everybody. Uh, and I'm going to send all these results back up to the ENN, e the ENN service and create a new generation based on those results. And you were talking about selection. So sure. selection is one of the, one of the kind of it's the, one of the pillars of evolution, which basically says, OK, I have a, I have a population. How am I going to call that population to see who, which, which of the candidates are going to be able to breed to, to create the next generation of, of candidates? And then we go through that whole process all over again. Such an interesting topic, Dan. And it's literally AI designing AI Indeed. in itself. Indeed. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Todd. Thanks for having me. And thank you for joining This Is My Architecture.